finding ways to visually represent mathematical concepts can be a great way for people to further understand those concepts, and to get people who aren't as open to looking at equations and numbers to give mathematics a second chance if their first approach in school didn't seem that exciting. The Fibonacci spiral is one of, if not the, most referenced visualization of a math concept in contemporary culture. You probably see it everywhere because it's relatively simple to understand. Take the Fibonacci sequence, make squares that have side lengths as long as the numbers in the series, cluster them around each other and draw arcs of a circle throughout and voila, you have your golden spiral. Or perhaps you simply like to flip through the graphs of all the connecting lines, also known as diagonals, of different regular polygons which trace out mandala-like patterns for your personal use. Or maybe you want to express the numbers in each row of Pascal's triangle as stacks of binary squares to produce vaguely alien-looking shapes that could inspire creatures and enemies for possibly an 8-bit adventure game. There's a lot of potential creativity that can go into making math more visually accessible and interesting, and it's always good to have more people appreciate math and understand more how it can help them in their daily lives. For this video, I want to show you another way we can manipulate the Fibonacci sequence to create some more interesting designs. These designs are related to a concept associated with the Fibonacci sequence called a Pisano period, which I'll walk you through quickly before we get to the actual drawing of the designs. So in order to understand Pisano periods, we have to understand the modulo operation. The modulo operation finds the remainder after you divide one integer by another. So if you remember when you learned about division, you probably learned about dividing a number, let's say 11, by a divisor, let's say 5. The result, also known as the quotient, was 2, because you could subtract two fives out of 11, and the remainder, or whatever's left over, is 1. So the remainder is 1 after dividing 11 by 5. We can write this another way by saying that 11 modulo 5 is equal to 1. The number that we're dividing by to find the remainder, which we previously called the divisor, is now called the modulus. Keeping this in mind, we can evaluate something like 14 modulo 3. We subtract 3 as much as we can from 14, and when we're done, we have 2 left over. So 14 mod 3 is equal to 2. If we try to evaluate 14 mod 5, we can subtract 2 5s from 14 and get a remainder of 4. But if we evaluate 15 mod 5, we can subtract 3 5s and get a remainder of 0. This shows us that the remainder's value is always going to be between 0 and 1 less than the modulus. We can see this if we took a regular number line and applied a consistent modulus to every number on it, let's say 3. We would notice that the resulting sequence would cycle through the remainders 0, 1, 2, and then repeat itself forever. And this should be expected since on the number line we're just adding 1 to each next step. You can see how the remainders form a natural loop of sorts, and this holds for any modulus you use on the number line. Now this is where the Fibonacci sequence comes into play. The Fibonacci sequence is made by starting with 0 and 1, and then each next term is the sum of the two terms before it. So the sequence continues with 0 plus 1 equals 1, 1 plus 1 equals 2, 1 plus 2 equals 3, 2 plus 3 equals 5, 3 plus 5 equals 8, 5 plus 8 equals 13, and so on. Let's substitute our number line with the Fibonacci sequence and see what happens when we divide by a common modulus of 3. As before, we get another repeating sequence, and this time the sequence is 0, 1, 1, 2, 0, 2, 2, 1. This also works if we take the Fibonacci sequence mod 4. The resulting looping part is 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 1. And it works for 5, and 6, and 7, and 8, and actually it works for every modulus, just like with the regular number line. Every modulus results in a sequence of looping remainders. These sequences are said to be periodic, and the length of each looping part of the sequence is known as the Pisano period. The Fibonacci sequence mod 5, with the resulting loop of 20 terms, would be said to have a Pisano period of length 20. If you were to graph the Pisano periods of different moduli, you will notice that the periods tend to get larger and larger as the modulus increases, though the actual values still fluctuate up and down quite a lot. You may be interested in just looking at the lengths of the periods themselves and try to figure out why these lines appear, for example, if you really wanted to. But we want to get back to these designs, which are all generated using the Fibonacci sequence with moduli of different integers. Let's start with this group over here. Remember how before I traced out the sequence for the number line mod 3? I basically put three points evenly spaced on a circle. 
labeled them with all the possible remainders, and drew lines between the points according to the progression of the sequence. You can see how this would create some pretty regular looking polygons inscribed in circles for any modulus we used. But with the Fibonacci numbers, suddenly the sequences are more seemingly irregular. With the Fib series mod 4, for example, we start at 0, hit 1 twice, go to 2, go to 3, and then we jump back to 1 again before returning to 0, our starting point. It's a pretty irregular looking shape, yet if we used the Fib series mod 5's sequence, with 5 points around the outside, we jump from 0 to 1, to 1, 2, 3, back to 0, over to 3 twice, then to 1, 4, 0, 4, 4, 3, 2, 0, 2, 2, 4, 1. And then finally the sequence restarts. This time we happened to cover every possible diagonal, which again are the lines that connect any two points. With mod 6, the resulting shape doesn't cover every single diagonal, but it still has vertical symmetry, and mod 8 gives another shape with an asymmetrical design. Filling the other designs for moduli 1 through 9 seem to yield a different design for each one. Then there's the design for the Fib series mod 10, with a period of 60. It's a pretty long period compared to the others shown thus far, and therefore has a more complex arrangement of intersecting lines, yet it still ends up being symmetrical and comes across as a relatively nice and tidy design compared to some of the other ones. This one is my personal favorite. Of course, since we have an infinite amount of integers to use as moduli, we can generate an infinite amount of designs. Some of the designs have many connecting lines due to having a longer Pisano period, and some are really simple. Some manage to pull it together and create a nice symmetrical balance, while others descend into a chaotic mess. And while the designs tend to get more complex as the periods tend to increase, there doesn't seem to be much rhyme or reason as to why they're so different from each other, or what determines if a design is symmetrical or not. At least, not at first. However, during my research on these designs, which included watching a few great videos by the channel Numberphile, which you should totally check out for supplemental material, links are in the description, I picked up on the fact that each looping mod sequence contained either 1, 2, or 4 zeros. Now there are proofs that exist as to why the number of zeros is always 1, 2, or 4, but I was more interested in their correlation with the symmetry of the resulting designs. I noticed that sequences with four zeros always seemed to make symmetrical designs, sequences with one zero always made asymmetrical designs, and sequences with two zeros seemed to go either way. So perhaps it would be nice to figure out why that is, and see if there's a way to prove that those patterns hold up for any integer modulus that we use. The other thing that I noticed after a bit is that while these designs look mostly disconnected from each other on the surface, there are some designs that are actually quite similar, and only differ by a couple of added lines. For example, the designs for mods 13, 34, and 89 all are almost identical, and so are the designs for mods 8, 21, and 55. You might notice that all of those numbers are themselves Fibonacci numbers, and the designs alternate between the two sets as you count down the line. So perhaps there's a pattern forming here with these designs, one subset of which looks like it's the other but copied and flipped over onto itself. It seems too good to be a coincidence. You may also notice that the same thing holds true for mods 11, 29, and 76, as well as 7, 18, and 47. These numbers are actually all part of another sequence in math called the Lucas numbers, which is a sequence that is generated by the same rule as Fibonacci, but instead starts with 2 and 1 instead of 0 and 1. And again, I think it's pretty easy to tell the similarity that these two groups of designs have with each other in the visual sense. Unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be many other ways of looking for visual connections between the rest of the designs, at least from my point of view at the moment. However, maybe you will find similarities in the rest of the shapes that reveal more hidden ways of grouping these designs together that I could not find. Let's step back a bit and look at the big picture for a second. We're essentially picking and choosing which points we connect in potential polygons for all of these shapes, and the thing that mainly determines how the lines will turn out, besides the modulus, is the sequence of numbers itself. We might get this shape through the Fibonacci series mod 10, but what if we changed our base sequence from the Fibonacci numbers to something else? If we decided to use Lucas numbers mod 10, for instance, that would give a different set of remainders that happen to loop, but it makes a different design. The same would happen if we use triangular numbers, which use a completely different rule of producing terms compared to the Lucas or Fibonacci numbers. The rule for the triangular numbers is basically just to always increase the difference between two successive terms by one. If we decided to use prime numbers, the sequence of remainders does not loop, yet it just happens to contain mainly only 1, 3, 7, and 9 for whatever reason. 
And of course, nothing's preventing you from just picking random remainders and seeing what shape they happen to make. The point is that using the Fibonacci sequence is just the ingredient we decided to use in the recipe for making cool combinations of diagonals. And maybe the Fibonacci sequence is really special to you, and for that reason, the specific designs you get from using the Fibonacci sequence hold more meaning to you. But this also lets you know that you can extend this concept of using these modular frameworks to interpret various other sequences, not just Fibonacci numbers. This can open up a whole new world of exploring why different moduli, in combination with different number sequences, make specific designs. One last thing that I want to show you before we move on to other things. I want to show what happens when you substitute the regular Fibonacci sequence, which starts with 0, 1, 1, with a Fibonacci sequence multiplied by another number, 2 for example. So all the terms are now twice as large. When you make designs for the different moduli of this sequence, you'll get a bunch of designs that we had before, but you'll also get several new ones. In fact, you can probably see that all the designs of the regular sequence are still there, but they now appear in every other modulus used. If we were to use a Fibonacci sequence multiplied by 3 to start, the resulting designs of the moduli would show the original series cropping up in every third design. Likewise, if our starting sequence was multiplied by 4, we would expect that the original Fib sequence modulus designs would appear every fourth design, and indeed, they do. The designs centered around the Fib sequence times 2 also appear every other design in this case. It is almost like we're dealing with fractions of the original moduli with the way that these designs appear in relation to each other. If in the original Fibonacci sequence we were to label each of the modular designs with the number correlating to the modulus used, we would just get a list of integers for the labels. So when we switch to using the Fibonacci sequence times 2, we might be tempted to label the first one here with a number of 1 half, and the next new one 3 halves. But we should be careful about this. As far as I can tell, moduli can only be integers, so in labeling these modular designs we should be careful not to say that they were produced by evaluating the Fibonacci sequence, quote, mod 1 half, or mod 3 halves. Instead, I think it's better to label these designs more like design 1, design 2, design 3 over 2, etc., to remove a bit of faulty connotation. In this designation, the top number is the modulus used, and the bottom number is the multiplier of the original Fibonacci series. And with an infinite amount of integers available, we can basically make as many designs as there are rational numbers. That is the bulk of work that I've done with these type of designs. There is another thing that I'm currently working with, attempting to match up circular designs with fractional approximations of some common irrational numbers, but I might leave that for a follow-up video. Right now I want to make sure that we don't forget about the second group of designs that I showed you at the beginning of this video. These designs are also built off of modulations of the Fibonacci sequence like before, but the rules for drawing the shapes are obviously pretty different. For this, we're translating these modulated sequences into paths, where every step of the path is either a left turn and then forward one unit if the term in the sequence is odd, or a right turn and then forward one unit if the term is even. If the term is zero, we don't turn or move at all. I've arbitrarily decided that the starting direction we face is to the right, and since every sequence starts with zero, nothing happens. Let's use the number line as our reference sequence for a second. Since the number line alternates between even and odd numbers, the resulting graph is going to first turn left and move for number one, then turn right and move for number two, then turn left again for three, then right again for four, and so on forever. If we use the original Fibonacci sequence, we end up cycling through the sequence of left turn, left turn, right turn, because the Fibonacci sequence's numbers cycle through odd, odd, and even. I'll let you figure out why that is. Interestingly enough, the resulting design we get also loops on itself, and as a bonus, it just happens to look like the addition symbol, which is fitting for Fibonacci numbers, I suppose. But now, when we start substituting in modded Fibonacci sequences, we get many different sequences of even and odd numbers, which will lead to many different designs. It's interesting to note that unlike in the first batch of designs we looked at, several moduli will result in identical designs. Some designs are completely contained and loop on themselves, while others repeat a pattern that has a general direction heading off to infinity. So far, I haven't looked into what may influence one modulus to produce one type of design while another modulus produces something completely different. And just like with the circular designs we looked at before, you can substitute your beginning sequence in with anything and produce more designs that way for whatever reason. 
It's important to take away that all of the stuff we're doing may not result in incredibly complex or thought-provoking designs, but the fact that these designs are motivated by a mathematical understanding is what makes them special. It's also important to note the artistic and creative significance working with things like this has. Hopefully this video can be used as a springboard for you to think about how math might motivate designs in your everyday life, and how the application of a certain instruction for building designs can be expanded upon to create more and more interesting artwork and cool visual things to look at. It can be seen as a different way of making art, in that it's much more procedural and you basically are creating a set of instructions that produces unknown final results, akin in many ways to the work of conceptual artists like Sol LeWitt. Or maybe you disagree that making designs based off of purely mathematical data is even art at all. Maybe math visualizations are in a class of visual performance all by themselves. How does this discussion of visualization and artwork connect to other types of data and visualizations for things completely unrelated to core math concepts? Hopefully I'll have more to share regarding what we looked at in this video in the future. Please leave comments about what you discovered relating to anything talked about in this video, whether they be mathematical proofs or patterns linked to the concepts discussed, or other ways to expand the visualization process. I'll be very interested in what we can come up with. Thanks for watching.